with this time. I go for mine. I get to shine. Now throw your hands up. We have a special, special, very special uh, bonus episode. You were just here on Friday. It's like two days later, three days later, and here we are again at This Week in Startups. No, we haven't gone daily or bi-weekly or anything like that, but two of my great friends and co-workers uh, are here. They happen to be in Los Angeles, so we figured we should turn on the interwebs, boot up the servers, and do a quick interview. Uh, with me today, Ryan Block and Peter Rojas of GD, GT, hey, GDGT.com, uh, which is an incredible gadget site, but you may know them from their previous sites. Peter founded Gizmodo.com, um, the number two gadget website in the world. And then Peter went on to found Engadget.com, the number one gadget site in the world, with Ryan Block as his uh, number two, and then eventually Ryan became the editor-in-chief. So, Thanks for being on the program, guys. Welcome to Los Angeles. Thanks, and uh, thanks for accommodating us. Yeah, of course. Being I on, mean, the audience for a days, is so. uh, psyched to have you guys here already. We just did this like quick thing, and you know, almost a hundred people in the room. Oh, we do have sound. Great. Um, so, uh, okay, first caller, support. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, we could actually do that. There's actually a, we ha we can take calls. Uh, that would be actually kind of funny, but we. Uh, I would Wouldn't actually. I would be pretty. I'd be pretty terrible at support. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I lose patience very quickly. No, you're not as good as like Leo Laporte or. Chris no, Rilla? he's he's really good. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not so good at that. I can give it a shot, but you know. Yeah. So, um, we, Peter, you and I met. I guess now five or six years ago. It was. Uh, we met in. 2003. Um, no, we met in the beginning of 2004. We had actually already decided to do a gadget together. 2004. 2004. Right. Like I think we went out for dinner. Yeah. Like. February of 2004. February of 2004. Yeah. You had previously uh, worked with Nick Denton of Gawker Media fame on building out Gizmodo. How did that start? So, um, well, I knew Nick from San Francisco. I was an editor at Red Herring during the dot com boom. And actually, I knew who you were because you were the editor of Silicon Alley Reporter, of course, which yeah. was sort of um, the, Red the East Coast East. version yeah. Yeah, of, uh, of Red Herring. And um, the uh, so I knew Nick. He was the chairman of a company called Moreover, and sure. living in San Francisco, and so we become friends. And um, we I moved to New York, and actually kind of helped convince him to move to New York. Ah. And um, we were hanging out at a bar called Sweet and Vicious on Spring Street. In, sure. Um, you hipster. Yeah, in New York. <laughs> yep. And we were talking about blogging. We both have been blogging. I started a blog in um, like a personal blog in. in um, Summer of 2001, Paul Bhutan, who was um, my editor, I was freelancing for Wired after I left right. Red Herring, and so he was like, "You have to start a blog, like write and keep." It. I'm like, "Why would I give away my writing? Yeah, when I'm used to getting paid like two bucks a word to write yeah. for uh, the days of two dollars a word. Yeah, two or <laughs> as opposed to two cents a word. Yeah, it's gone way down. Um, yeah. And uh, so Nick and I were talking about blogging, and, and and I was talking about why I didn't blog as much as I why as I wanted to, and we kind of just thought about, well, what if you could build a, a blog that was a business rather than just a hobby? Right. Um, which something that no one had really done. I think the only person who had really done it was Glenn Fleshman with yeah. Wi-Fi Networking News. Wi-Fi Networking News, and, yeah. And he had built sort of like this, this great trade site. It was like the site about Wi-Fi. In the years when Wi-Fi actually was a big thing. Yeah, yeah. it was like, well, we, yeah, we were like, where, what's going to happen with Wi-Fi, right? It was like a big kind of, you know, yeah. thing. And so this is going to change everything. Yeah, like spring of 2002. Yeah. Uh, and um, so we decided... Well, I, I mean, I'm a tech writer, so I would do something with tech. Right. Uh, and we thought, well, gadgets is something that is kind of, and this yeah. is, here's the thing, here's how much things have changed. We're like, there aren't really that many gadget websites. Right, there's not much, there's nobody really no covers gadgets. No one writes gadgets. about gadgets. So yeah, they write about software, site? they write about companies, the internet, but gadgets, not so much. Yeah, so, so there wasn't really anything like that. And, um, so we well, you know, I don't know, not, not, not to completely derail, but at the time, gadgets were also not. Well, gadgets, the level of ga yeah, gadgets right? have gotten a lot more it was interesting. Like, it was like unusual if you, if you as a consumer had a laptop, a cell phone, and digital a digital camera. camera. If you had like now it's that's like that's trifecta. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean now everyone is expected to have those three things. Now Increasingly you probably have less. multiple ones of those. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You've got a camera you did, although, on your laptop. Although cameras, cameras yeah. pulling back a little bit because you know more and more and more going to the cell phone. Right. But that's like the thing. In, in, in back then, it was very strange if you had all three of those devices. You probably had a desktop. Maybe you had a digital camera. Right. Possibly you had a cell phone. You probably didn't have all three unless you were like you know right. super geek, road warrior, whatever. And if you did have a cell phone, it was and a pretty one dimensional. I mean, one. the iPod yeah. was six months old at that point. Right. So it was still, I mean, a, a, a very very different world. And the iPod was in some ways like 
the start of the gadget revolution. It was and kind of the start of this whole thing, and so I just kind of got lucky that I, I randomly right um, right place. Right. I time. mean, I love gadgets, but it was it was kind of like, well, we could do gadgets, or we could do some other you know some other areas or whatever. But this seemed like the one that seemed like you could actually build a business out of. We weren't sure how. I mean, there was no Google AdSense. Advertising on the web was dead. I mean, people right, thought AdSense that AdSense really didn't exist. That AdSense much, didn't huh? exist. AdSense actually launched after we launched in Gadget. Wow, we forget about that. Right. Uh, and so um, we actually uh, we got Mina Trot herself to design Gizmodo. Wow. Which I think says much about how things. I actually flew to San Francisco, I, um, and I sat down with Mina her Trot, and, the founder of Six Apart. Apart. Yeah, of Six, Six Apart, Apart Multi. I mean, and everything. could you imagine? I mean, that's like, yeah. completely unheard of that you would be able to get the person who built the platform to just be like, oh, yeah, and I'll, yeah. Des- I'll design the site for you, too, yeah. while, we're, while we're at it. Right. Uh, it's kind of flagship for them, though. It, it was. You know, it's I mean, like, it, movable type. It was, it, it, blogging 2001 was not as big of a deal. And, uh, you know, movable type, that was probably what, the biggest installation of movable type. It was, at the time. yeah, I mean, they were looking for, I mean, it was like, it was like still kind of a hobby for them. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't even really a business yet. Yeah. And, uh, and so we started Gizmodo, and, and the way we promoted it was we just emailed friends of ours and, um, and kind of let it go from there. And then right. um, after a couple of years, uh, I mean, I remember you first emailed me. I did a post where I referenced a Kurosawa film in the title right. of the post. High and low. High and low. Uh, you remember. And yes. And no one, I mean, you were the only person that got it. Right. Um, and so you emailed me, and I was kind of yep. like, I don't know about this Calcanis guy. Because right. when I was at Red Herring, we were <laughs> yeah. like, Calcanis, Calcanis is a snake is oil salesman. <laughs> <laughs> you know. He's doing a magazine about the internet. That's just total BS. <laughs> Wait a second, what are we doing? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I was kind of like, well, you know, I'm going to talk to this guy a little yeah. bit. Can't and, hurt. Um, I was already kind of thinking about what do I now, do. Now, you had seen that Kurosawa film. Yeah, I had just seen it because um, they were doing... Where, at the Film Forum? At Film Forum, they were they doing the a Kurosawa series yeah. Yeah, for like that whole Which summer. I, did. I went to like every single one. Yeah, and for about... I don't know. I don't know. I lived in, as an adult in Manhattan from the age of maybe 21 until I was 33 or 34. Uh, they had that Kurosawa festival like every summer. Yeah. Uh, and I would see a couple of films each year for five years in a row. And that was always one of my favorites. Yeah, it's an amazing film. A great if you, film. If you haven't seen it, I mean, anybody. Watch, Supposedly, you Spielberg's seen it. making it over. Spielberg has really? bought the rights from Toho. Uh, not Toho. Um, uh, what was the company they did all of Kurosawa's films? Anyway, they, they have that logo on the opening of all Kurosawa yeah. films, the round one with the sparkles. But anyway, supposedly he's going to make a, a modern day. But High and Low, for people who don't know, was like an allegorical film noir. It was know. one of his like few non sort of samurai non samurai film. It was like a, yeah, it was like a film noir, like the like yeah. a murder in Tokyo. Yeah, it re- and, it's great. Yeah, really it's well done. really good film. Actually, a lot of, there's a lot of films from that noir. Stray Dog. And uh, a couple of other ones. If you, actually, one of the best ones to see is Iduru, which uh, is To Live. Yeah. And it's, I think it's only available on VHS tape, but yeah. it does play once in a while on IFC. And it's basically one of, the, you know, one of his final films, but it's about uh, basically a, a clerk in a Japanese like, government building who has been doing it for 20 or 30 years and then finally has this epiphany like, what am I doing with my life? Just sitting there with stacks of papers around him, and then it's what happens to him from that. He wants to do something good in his life. Yeah, because he realizes all I've done is move paper around, and, I guess and that's, that's what led both of us yeah. here today. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to go on a little tangent sometimes because the audience always appreciates hearing like the little nuances of people. I find. Yeah. Uh, so both Kurosawa films. I emailed you, and uh, truth be told, on the other side of that, I had been thinking about hiring Elizabeth uh, Spears yeah. or Spires. 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 Um, to work for what was then this idea of Weblogs Inc. Yeah. And I emailed her and emailed her and she uh, she was like, ah, I'm pretty good and I'm going to go do magazines because that's the future. You know, I'm going to use blogs to get to a magazine yeah. job. And I was like, really? You're going to be number 30 or 40 you know, most important person at New York Magazine, which is like the 300th or 400th most important magazine in the world? Like, Why would you give up being the number one blogger at that time? Yeah. But Shani Jardin said, because uh, I had asked her advice of that, and she said, oh, you should be Peter Rojas. So I was reading you for about a month, and I was just reading and reading, and I was like, I have to talk to this guy at some point. And then I read that post, I said, that's a perfect opportunity. And yeah. That guessed was, your email. It was, I mean, it was funny. And, you were being and, stalked. Uh, I guess I was being cyber-stalked. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, uh, I wasn't, sh- I mean, I was going through a period where I wasn't sure what was going to happen, because remember, people forget how small things were at this point and how like it could have gone a lot of different directions and um, the economy sucked the economy sucked um, it, it, I mean Nick's strategy was to have single person sites people, bloggers working 
half time or part time. He didn't right. want to have more than one editor. He didn't want to have full time people. He didn't want right. to have more than ten posts. Yeah, he wanted it to be very like lightweight, very lightweight, right. and um, pay and people a thousand dollars a month. Yeah, I mean, I, I made I made twelve fifty a month. Twelve fifty a month um, was the starting. I, I, was, I had, to, had to fight to get above a <laughs> thousand. <laughs> And uh, and they I, still do though. So. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure there's still a lot of fighting there. Um, and, and I had to uh, to to work really hard to. Uh, uh, I mean, I had to really think really hard about like what I wanted to do after Gizmodo because I couldn't. Survive. I was going broke. Right. Um, and my options were go and flip it into a magazine job like Elizabeth did. Right. And I had actually turned down a job at Money Magazine to be their technology editor. Right. And I was which like, is a pretty significant gig. That might have been like. 50 grand, 60 grand, was, 70 grand? It was a 70 or 80 grand a year job for someone who, and I made, I mean, in 2003, 30. I made, I went back, 35. To, I made $13,000 oh that year. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, nothing. Yeah, kids, if you're thinking about getting in the writing business, not much has really changed yeah. in that regard. <laughs> uh, and so, um, oh, it's true. People talk about journalism being like such a bad gig now, and it's like, you know what? It's, it's always, always been, been bad. It's always what are you talking about? Gig. Conte Conte never made money. Content starting salary it's was just, like it's 18, just there, 19, yeah. there are fewer bad gigs now. Right. That's the thing. It's a smaller exactly. pool of miserable exactly. jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a smaller pool of miserable jobs. More wait, people so wait, fighting so for with, those miserable so when I, jobs. When I first met Peter, um, that was in 2001. You just moved to New York. Yeah. And you were still freelancing for like yeah. Wired and a couple of other publications. And I remember um, we hadn't talked for like six or eight months or something. And uh, and I heard you're doing this gadget blog, and I was like, all right, well, you know, I don't know, what, like, what's a, what's a, like, what's a gadget blog going to be, you know? I think there was like, there was no there was no prototype, right? Yeah. You know, there was nothing out there like that in the time. So, um, and then I followed Gizmodo for a while, uh, kind of casually, and then I, I eventually followed you over to Engadget um, when you you when you guys had linked up and yeah. eventually started that, um, and then reached out. And, but anyway, that's I think we'll get yeah. to that in a moment. We're on the cusp of it, in fact. Yeah. But you 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 had met him before. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I did his mother. Yeah. I did him since like 2001. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so wow, small world. I didn't realize that you knew him before me. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I didn't know. Through, that. Just just through friends. Just through friends in New York. Yeah. yeah. Um, Being in New York. So then you, uh, I come to you and say, basically, hey. Uh, I'll make you a partner in this business. Yeah. You'll get to own a chunk of it, and we could build something special here. And you said that sounds better than getting paid twelve fifty a month. Yeah, I mean, it was. It actually took me a little while to sort of to to pull the trigger. I mean, it, I had a few weeks where I really kind of went back and forth, and it was like there was a lot of risk. And you have to remember, like at the time, blogging was so small that people felt like there's the natural order of blogging was that you would have one blog for each subject. Right? Would why would you like, have two? There was like, yeah, why would you have two gadget blogs? Like you already have sense. a gadget blog. Yeah, you um, can't make a second. Yeah. And, and now there's like two thousand <laughs> gadget yeah, blogs. Thousands of them. Boing boing gadgets. Two gadget blogs. Yeah. But that Every was minute. literally like how people like thought about yeah. things. And so, and I kind of thought. Am I going to leave Gizmodo and then just? I mean, what happens if I fail? Like, what happens if it doesn't work out? What happens right. if like no, the audience doesn't come with me at all? Like, right. what if they just don't care? And 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 and, and then and I'll somehow have, like, you got over that risk. I got over that risk. I mean, my father like actually, I sat, I went home for Christmas, right. um, and uh, and I sat down with him, and I'm like, I mean, this is like the biggest decision I've had to make as you know my basically my life right. um, so far, and uh, and I don't know, you know, what to do because, I mean, I you know, I know that I don't want to. Go to law school, which was one of the other options I had right. at the time, and I and I turned down the magazine jobs because it just didn't feel like the right thing I wanted to do. But um, I, I kind of felt a little bit trapped, right? Like right. I, I felt like I had this thing, and like I could give it up. And somebody else gets it. Yeah, and somebody else gets it, and then right. all of a sudden, like smart just, money jobs gone. Yeah, you didn't take that. You're an idiot. So it's like uh, uh, I, I had to kind of make that you know make that tough decision, and um, it, it was it was painful. My dad said, you know, you. If you don't do it, you're gonna not just the typical like my dad didn't say to like you regret the things you do, you regret you know whatever right, right. don't do whatever. He didn't say something like that. He said he said look, he's like you have are a tremendously power, like talented person. And, like I, I think that you have to do the thing that um, you really want to do. And what you really want to do is you really want to take blogging and do something great with it. You right. want to do it full time. Like this is what you you know. He's like you're happy. You right. know? And, and I was like, well, that's true. I mean, I, I, and that was the whole point of doing Engadget was I wanted to take blogging and I wanted to be able to do with blogging something that I actually couldn't do with Gizmodo, which was do it full time, build out a team, really invest right. uh, like 100 and like, you know, 20% of my time. You were throttled because Nick Denton had a vision Yeah, that he looked at you as a worker bee, a cog in the wheel. You were like the servers or an Arion chair or whatever. He you looked know, at like, it as interchangeable. Yeah, you're the just The writers were interchangeable to him. Right. At, at that time, to his credit, he now looks at it differently, I think. Yeah, I think... Slightly. Uh, well, his, I mean, the Gawker's model became more like the Weblogs Inc. model, which Absolutely. is like, you know... They evolved together. Team, yeah, yeah, exactly. The teams of people and stuff like that. Sure. And so, 
um, you know, we left and started in Gadget and. Um, uh, you know what's interesting though when you I was listening to that story of you like this is like the hardest decision of my life to make. And now I, I look at you like as CEO and founding these companies and doing all this stuff and you make much more d- difficult decisions like every day. Yeah, I mean I looking back on that decision doesn't it look like the easiest most obvious decision ever? It, yeah, look, I mean in retrospect, but right. um, But even if it didn't work out, it's what's the downside risk? Losing a twelve hundred a twelve hundred dollar a month job. Yeah, I know that but, you know has I, you trapped in a six hundred dollar a month apartment making ends yeah, I mean, I, I think the, I think that the fear was that about losing that relevancy um, right. and being part of it because at Gizmodo, like I was a, a part of that conversation, and I think that was the part that I was, I, I didn't want to lose that that place right. within the conversation, so to speak. You didn't want to risk losing it, even though you could gain so much more. Yeah, and you actually thought, gee, if I lose that, I, I'm. I'm yeah, and I mean there were other opportunities. I mean, there was that you know television show we had in development with Spike. Yep. and I was worried that. I, I don't want to like li- like lose that opportunity sure. and stuff like that. So. And what you didn't realize at that time, because at that time you weren't an entrepreneur. At that point in time, you were. I was an entrepreneur. I was an editor. You were uh, an editor. Yeah. But that moment, I believe, looking back on historically, was probably the moment you became an entrepreneur. Yeah, and the funny thing is, like, I didn't. That's really when it think switched. That, I didn't really start thinking of myself as an entrepreneur until way into Engadget. Yeah. Like, I didn't really think of myself as someone. I thought of myself as someone who, their career path was. To, I mean, when I was at Red Herring, my goal in life was to be an editor at, like, yeah. you know, a magazine. To be, like, editor-in-chief editor of a magazine. Editor-in-chief someday, of, right. You know, when I, maybe in 20 years, I'll be the editor-in-chief right. of some magazine somewhere. That was my goal in life. It's, it's really interesting that that moment just happened right there. And you look back on it, and it's like, so many people face that moment every single, you know, year or whatever, where they just... They have some amazing opportunity, and they just think, gosh, you know, I'm going to lose this and this. And what they don't see is all those signals... Mm-hmm. That they should be an entrepreneur. In fact, the signal of I got the job with, you know, Gizmodo is going good and it's something I can lose, and the signal of the Spike TV thing is going on, those are all signals I should be telling you you're making things happen. Those are signals that you should take more risks, that you should go do things, yeah. not signals that you should be more conservative. Yeah, I mean, I definitely uh, think that, um, you know, I've had to learn to, to. Unlearn. Yeah, unlearn things and also raise you know, my tolerance for risk. You know, I mean, I give Ryan a lot of credit for taking huge risks when it came to Engadget. I mean, he worked for Engadget for, for months for free and then took a big pay cut I to, remember come these discussions. The, to come on as a full time editor. I remember this. I remember, remember we sat down with him me. at E3. Yeah. And we're like, okay, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to convince you to like leave your job where you're making a lot of money, take its big pay cut? Right. You were at this uh, uh, analytics company, read something from Australia it was, it or something was a, German. It was a CMS company. A CMS company yeah, yeah, yeah. from Germany, or Australia, Germany. Germany. Yeah. Germany. You're making bank. I mean, basically, it's okay. better well. than a money editor, a money magazine, smart money editor, probably. I mean, I was, you know, I was actually smart money. I was money. actually in the. I wasn't an editor, right? I was actually in the technology industry, working yeah. for a technology managing company. servers. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was it, it was, was, it was, good, good it was kind of a big deal, but. You know, it was kind of the same thing as Peter. I mean, it, and you had no writing experience, and he well, gave, no, I, I went to you? school for writing, but oh, I, I didn't. That's have, why I reached out to him because I knew that he. Yeah, there were there were three things I knew about Ryan. One, I knew he was had been a creative writing major, right? Uh, um, in literature, yeah. in literature. Two, I knew that he knew tech. And three, I knew that he was kind of like a snotty New York hipster kid who right. like kind of like came at tech at that same kind of direction that I came at right. it from. And I thought that was something that like was really critical actually to right. Engadget. It was like it wasn't just that you knew tech or gadgets or that you're enthusiastic about it, but you had to kind of approach from the right mix of like kind of skepticism and enthusiasm to right. make it all work together. And a little bit of like understanding that like tech and gadgets were becoming more more like pop culture. Yeah. Right. And you know, to Peter's credit, I, I'd never put two and two together to write about tech. Right. I mean, it seems so like yeah, Duh. You, you write and you like tech, you write <laughs> about tech. chocolate. But you know, it's like I mean, I was a literature major, right? So I was thinking about like, oh, okay, you know, where where can I write stuff? And uh, and, and tech had never really occurred to me. But yeah, I mean, um, there's some dark poetry that yeah, we have exactly. To <laughs> yes, <laughs> great. My, my goth years, goth poetry. Um, we got to dig up. <laughs> no, so you know, is uh, those those early months of Engadget were really really fun. And um, like we knew that were, we had something crazy. special. Like we yeah. knew, like we, we we didn't know how far it was it could go, but we knew we had something I did. that was like. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, one of the things I remember um, early early on was you'd been doing obviously Gizmodo, and you went basically straight to Engadget. So you were you were burnt out. I mean, 
it's it's kind of hard to express to people what that kind of schedule is like. Yeah, um, blogging. I mean, blogger yeah. burnout. 18, was... 20 hours a day, sometimes constant, nonstop. Yeah. you know, you gain a lot of weight. Yep. Like it's totally unhealthy. It's obsessive. It's it's actually kind of crazy. And I'm glad that this team blogging thing has really taken on because. Um, it's, Feeding it's the blog really, became too difficult. It's really, really hard to do alone. Yeah. And, you know, Peter was basically doing it alone for a number of years. And then a little bit with me, I was, I was doing it part-time. And there were a couple of other part-time contributing editors. But so he went on vacation. Uh, he, he decided, I, think I remember like, this. I need, I need he, to, like, ordered me to do I, it. I yeah. ordered you to do it. I was like, you have to go on vacation, he, dude. You he, had, he, had to. he had to. He went on vacation. And, and, um, and so it was going to be, like, just, like, a long weekend. So I actually I took like uh, I took a long weekend for my day job. I took some of my vacation days yeah, I to this. to man and gadget um, to you know but you know it was part time. So I was uh, I took my vacation days to do and gadget. And the funny thing is actually you were like I remember you sitting me down like the night or two nights before Peter left and being like all right you know like we're trusting you with the keys you know yeah. this is this is the flagship don't like, scratch don't the test don't screw yeah. it up. But but if you do a good job I'm gonna get you a twenty dollar Amazon gift certificate. <laughs> Did I really? <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty hot. And it never came. <laughs> really? It never came. Crew. Crew, give me a twenty dollars Amazon gift certificate immediately. Um, <laughs> but no, and I remember that I was I was living in this apartment and uh, in uh, I mean that twenty dollars gift certificate could have come up handy. It's true, you know. I mean, I, I could have uh, bought like a RAM upgrade from. I would. I might have been five percent more productive. Absolutely. With that, uh, with Absolutely. That um, but more importantly, you had to make sure that the site did well so that. Peter could enjoy his vacation and come back exactly. and believe but that somebody else was capable of keeping the blog alive other than him. So it was, it was partly yes. that and also partly that I, you know, that was the first time I actually kind of sat down for a whole day and just did that. And so that was like the first time I got the opportunity, I think, to really think about it in terms of like, this could be a job. Yeah. Right. You know, this is actually something you that you could do. You the full scope of all the things you have the to do. The duties, it's not just yeah. like It's not just like showing up and, and, you know, writing a few posts. You have to really think holistically about a news cycle and like the vibe, what's worth doing, what's not worth is, doing, yeah. about making sure that you're constantly make, not missing anything, that you're constantly getting and then, stuff. And you know, the, it, the, then there's some like the logistics, stories. right? Like, yeah. you know, assigning stuff, assigning posting st- stuff. I mean, there's a, there's a million moving parts that, that people don't really think about in terms of, you know, getting a new story up every 15, 20 minutes. Although at that time it was like every hour to hour and a half. I, mean, I think we were on the hourly people. schedule at the we beginning. We were trying to be on the hourly. Now it's now in Gadget's like every like six and a half minutes there's a new post up. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, we I mean, first, that was, we were the first to go 24 hours though. We were the first yeah. to hire yeah. an overnight person. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, there was a lot of innovation there. Yeah, when Barb came on and she, she, I remember like that was like, I actually consider that to be like this golden era of Engadget when like Ryan started to be able to do more and then Barb came on yeah. and was like doing the overnight. And I remember like, I was like, wow, at the end of the night. And, and PT too. And, 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 yeah, and Phil right. Tyrone who went on ha- to Hack a Day, which yep. we created How for to him. Tuesday. And then he went um, to, um, uh, now he's at Make. Yeah, and I remember like being at the end of the night being able to like just check in with Barb and be like, okay, like here are the like, Ten things we didn't get to today, and like just keep an eye, and make sure like nobody announces anything in Japan while I'm asleep, right. you know. And I that was like, we just like were all, like operating on all cylinders, and we were just crushing everything else out there. I mean, well, I mean, people thought about blogging in such a small way, and we looked at it and had. I remember these long conversations you and I would have on either IM or in person, or when I would have dinner, just like what could this be? And I'd always say to you like, if I gave you like five hundred dollars more a month, what would you do? Yeah. And I kept offering you like. Imagine you had $1,000 a month. What would you spend it on? And at that time, like if, you're spe- if Gizmodo is spending twelve fifty a month, and I said to you, add another 1000 to that, what would you do? And you were like, I don't know. Maybe we could do a video. Or maybe we could do like a long-form how-to article. It's like, do the how-to article. Yeah. How much does that Start cost? doing interviews. Yeah, doing interviews. Like yeah. we were, it was just so, sort of wide open sort of possibility. Now it'll look so obvious. Yeah. Well, I think like we, were, we, we started to figure out like the possibilities of, of, the, of the format, of the medium, and build a, a web-native publication right. rather than something that was trying to be like a magazine right. uh, online, and right. I think that was what that was, you know, the key, you know, to to to, to what needed to happen. It was so funny to having to explain to people who came to work at Engadget and the other web blogs, blogs, what blogging was. Yeah, because we would try to hire journalists or people who say, "Hey, you're not going to work on one story for a week. You're going to you know, do was, five posts it was a day." The journalists actually, did uh, yeah, we had the hardest worst. trouble with journalists. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it, it got to the point, you know, there and were I a was couple, a journalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, well, but you were you were the journalist who kind of helped 
pioneer that yeah. transition. Well, it's right? and was, some people could like never they couldn't hack it. It's because I was, I've been so frustrated it. with journalism that like I loved blogging. Like I felt like I could finally write about stuff in the way I wanted. I mean, to I think the it. only reason I actually was able to take the blogging so easily is because I'd never written about yeah. tech before. It's and, a like, big I, advantage. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, all my all of my writing habits were tied up in like literature stuff and and you know like writing papers about books. And so I didn't really ever you know I didn't have any baggage you know journal baggage uh, about tech I right. could just kind of dive into it and, and clearly you know. the best bloggers were the best commenters because a comment was actually more akin to a blog post than a feature story yeah, in some ways and just, then you know a, a good comment, the, the, I mean, not, way, not like the average comment, but a good comment. Yeah, and, and so we always found like some of our best editors just through the site. You know, we'd never like post up in, in no, we didn't know, have like, to industry boards or anything like that. You know, very rarely was it like yeah, very rarely was a Craigslist. You want you want the readers. You know, yeah. it's something we do today. I mean, yeah. we we try to make all of our hires through the site or through our personal network. Uh, or people who follow us on Twitter or whatever, because those are the people who are like, most clued in. They're kind of the best sense what of what doing. it is that we're doing. And speaking yeah. of the audience, let me just give a quick message okay. to the audience. You know, we're uh, use the hashtag uh, twist pound t w i s t. If you have a question for Ryan or Peter uh, or both of them uh, about this incredible story of going from Gizmodo to Engadget, now their new startup gdgt.com, which you can go take a look at. Um, just put pound twist. Ask a question. If we answer your question, I can't give you a ticket to TechCrunch 50 2010 because we don't know if that's even going to happen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's going to happen. Didn't you read? Everything's good. It's just a puppet. It's like I'm talking to a puppet. I mean, do people not understand it's a joke? You tell the puppet all kinds of crazy things. I know. It's a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people take things too seriously. Anyway, uh, I don't even know what episode this is. What episode is it? Episode 17, a bonus episode. <laughs> I think every episode you're like, what episode is this? What and somebody yells in from the other Basically, I, I can't keep up. Um, but one of the great things about this is uh, it's a bonus episode. So we're not going to charge the sponsors for sponsoring it. However, you're I'm going to charge us. Yeah, I'm charging <laughs> you guys. It's a, new, it's a new model, pay per podcast. You basically pay per guest. Two people, uh, it's about $50 each. Uh, so. Um, I'll have my peep at, uh, people at Isaiah give you a call. Absolutely. I have your Isaiah rep call me. Uh, that was a pretty classic moment when I was doing Calacanis cast and I had him Tyler write Calacanis cast on his forehead. Did you ever see that? <laughs> no. Oh my God, it's the greatest moment in the history of podcasting. Uh, anyway, let me thank WebSpy uh, and DN. I have it on my screen here WebSpy, which is one of our great sponsors. Always good. It's one of the things we did at Weblog Sync, I think, particularly well, was always. Really work with the sponsors to make it work for them. Uh, so WebSpy, DNA Mail, everybody loves DNA Mail. Uh, Ustream, uh, another great company. They did a kick-ass job at TechCrunch. They have a new Android app. Oh, they do. Yeah, which I've been playing with. It's ah. really nice. So, you you can, can you Ustream out with it? Yep. Are you kidding? Yeah. So basically, if I buy this six hundred dollar phone, I can't Ustream out. I can only watch Ustream uh, on Wi-Fi. Basically, what? no. I was over the cellular network streaming. Uh, That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Unbelievable. Anyway, UStream uh, did a great job at TechCrunch 50, and they were doing live streaming from there, and like almost it wasn't it was quite HD, right, Alex? It was like SD. It, it was SD, but it was full res SD. Full res SD. So well. basically, it's like DVD quality. Yeah, it looked really good. Well, I watched oh, it. it was really I was good. in New York. I, yeah. Incredible quality. I mean, you know, that's almost, almost too good. Almost, almost too like, good. Like, almost, almost like you, you know, you might consider not doing such a good job next year. I, let me tell you something. It's ticket sales. We had big, big discussion about this. It doesn't really matter to me because it, we sell out anyway. Yeah. And it helps the companies. The reason we started the conference was to help the companies. So if we lose a couple of tickets here or there, who cares? It's going to sell out anyway, and it gets people excited about coming to the event. So. Once you see how exciting it is and there's a packed room, you're like, you know what? That's pretty good marketing to come. It's like a really high quality event. I want to go live and see what it's like live. Yeah. It's like if you saw like John Mayer on Saturday Night Live and you're like, I really like that. You know, it doesn't mean you're not gonna go see him live, you know? I think. I could be I'm probably wrong. If people go to conferences for the networking and to be able to connect exactly. with people. Exactly. Like that, Definitely so. a lobby conference. And Audible, Audible. Everybody loves Audible. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. And get like the first three months for half off or something crazy like that. It's a pretty good deal. Uh, great sponsors. You can thank the sponsors on Twitter. This is this is this is my new ad, ad format. Have you guys heard about this? Yeah. I mean, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever come up with. And you did this when we were on. Uh, <laughs> I was on. Uh, if you Twitter. may say so yourself. Yes, I do. No, honestly, I, you came up I, with I have about. I think my ratio of brilliant ideas 
to uh, all other types of ideas, good, bad, whatever, is about one to a hundred. <laughs> this is one of the brilliant ones. Thank the sponsors on Twist, because then they see it, they get followers, and they're like, I can't believe it. People are love this week in Startup so much, they're willing to thank the sponsors? They're willing to thank us? Most people like are TiVoing the commercials. My users, my, the Jason Nation, is actually <laughs> rebroadcasting the commercials. Yeah. DNA mail, whatever. What can we give them? Do we have any twi uh, Twist t-shirts? Uh, yeah. Uh, All right. So can you do me a favor? Can you look at whoever also, thanks the sponsors? Two more uh, Digital Family Summit tickets we can give away. All right. So there's two Digital Family Summit tickets. Just if you're in L.A., you want to come to that taping Wednesday night. Uh, and then there's a couple T-shirts. If you thank the sponsors, a couple of you will get some T-shirts. Fans made T-shirts and sent them to me. That's cool. Nice. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you guys about your new site. Yeah. I have to give a disclaimer. Disclosure, actually. <laughs> Not disclaimer. Disclosure. Disclosure. I'm an investor in the company, yep. uh, and I'm on the board. Yeah, you are on the board, too. I am on the board. At some point, we'll have a board meeting. Uh, yeah. why, don't we, why don't we make this the board meeting? Yeah, exactly. Get, I think we have a board. Get the other first, guys on the first, board. Are you first both order on the business. board or just one of you? We're both, both on the board. Both on the board. Yeah. Yeah. And then who, somebody, Tony from True Ventures, or who else? Uh, Tony, Confer to, uh, Tony Conrad from True Ventures, yeah. Yeah. Tony's great. So is yeah. that the, that's the board for? And then uh, Chip Bryan from Complex, who oh, okay. you'll actually love. He's uh, he is the independent or something? Uh, yeah, they actually, his company invested directly. Yes. Okay, cool. So anyway, uh, I'm on the board of this company. I invested in it a little bit. Not a, not a ridiculous investment, but it's, it's a, it was a seed round, I guess. It's a seed round, a little seed basic, round. basic seed round. And so I've got the site up here. It's actually interesting. We, the two investments I did this year so far were you guys and uh, Challenge Post yeah. out of New York, which is really cool. And I had Challenge Post, Brandon, from that on last week. And then I had you guys on this week. And then I'm going to do two more investments in two of the TechCrunch 50 companies, they think, if it works out. Are you going to say which? It's pretty easy to guess. <laughs> Start at the top and work your way down. Um, if it works out. Yeah. But I'm like, wow, this is going to become like a massive conflict. Now everyone's going to say I do TechCrunch 50 to invest in the company. It's like no good deed goes unpunished. But right? the thing is, like, when someone gets like, picked as a winner at TechCrunch 50, yeah. it actually becomes more difficult for you to invest. That's exactly what's happening right now yeah. in my email box because I am doing all the e intros to those people, to VCs, which I do for free for everybody. I'm like, oh, yeah, go meet this Because the interest goes up. So basically yeah. the valuations are going up. I'm getting screwed for giving them all this promotion. I mean, it's... But anyway, it's a whole different story. Uh, GDGT... You can go check it out right now, and if you want to know the the uh, at the the Twitter handle is at gdgt. Yeah, like so gadget, like no gadget vowels. without the vowels. Yeah. If you want to know how to pronounce it, and here's the logo. That's a pretty great iPhone case. I love that. Look at that. Beautiful. Um, and I guess it's Incipio. Incipio, Incipio made the case. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, Incipio makes groovy cases. I yeah, mean, these are like hard. But thin. But I don't thin, feel like yeah. I. Yeah, no. You know that's 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 the important part is that it's actually thin and it's. Mellow. It's got grip. You know, like when yeah. you try to spin it on the table, it doesn't spin. It sort of stops it, it itself. Adds, like it doesn't add any heft. A little bit to of friction at all. Yeah, no, little, they're really they're really nice. They made uh, made a few hundred of those for us for our San Francisco event, and I think we're. That's the logo. I love the logo of GDGT. I think we're gonna work. And you can call it gadget. You can call it gadget. gadget yeah. So people can just call it gadget. Uh, that's easier. I say GDGT so people know how to spell the URL. I've been saying gadget a little bit more lately, but. I yeah, people will get it. Anyway, uh, great to get a four. Was that four letter domain available? We had to buy it. We had to not, buy it, we but it's been very much. Surprisingly affordable. Yeah. Under a G? Yep. Oh, perfect. And the design is rounding yeah. area. So, what it, what it actually was is they, they'd been, uh, they had like the catalog of just letters, uh, you know? So, it was like GDGT, GDGT, uh, GDGS, GDGR. Oh, they're just waiting for people to buy them. GDG, yeah, GA. Yeah. They're yeah. like, hello, domain squatting scumbags. Yeah, I don't think they realized that they were sitting Which domain did we take of yours? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they realized exactly Bastards. <laughs> it's quite a business idea. I got the guy got to do that. Let's do it five letters. <laughs> they probably didn't get to five letters yet. Um, so, this is kind of crazy. You guys are like, hey, we did Gizmodo. We did Engadget. Yeah. Let's do another gadget site. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. That's in your kill zone. I've only built the two largest. So I guess the big question everybody will have is, uh, another gadget website, how is it different than the two previous ones? Well, well for starters, it's not a blog. Not a blog. It's yeah. not so a blog. That helps. Right. Um, actually, we, we decided, OK, if we're going to not do uh, a blog about gadgets, we're going to do a site about gadgets, but not a blog, what is all the stuff we would do? Right? And we just kind of looked at the entire universe of all the online gadget stuff that is being done and that isn't being done um, or that isn't being done well enough um, that isn't necessarily blogging uh, and we decided where to go from there. Yeah, um, I mean, but you know a lot of the stuff we, we, d we talk about the concepts and, and some of the things that eventually made it into the site for a while and uh, it, it seems 
kind of obvious. I mean, the direction. Yeah, I mean, the genesis of the site was um, uh, I, I really wanted to have a site where people could go and make lists of the gadgets that they have and gadgets that they want and kind of think about gadgets as your friends in a social network, just like your friends. Right. Because, I mean, I, you know, I, I, anyone who loves gadgets like I do or like Ryan does, like, you kind of want to, like, show it off and kind of talk about it. It's a very social have. thing. It's a very social thing, exactly. Like, it becomes, like, a part of how you define yourself and how you connect with other people. Uh, and Ryan, you know... Right. Are you an iPhone user or a BlackBerry user or an Android it's user? Kind of that, that answer yeah, is... Yeah, it's a little tribal, right? That tells you something about the person. Yeah, and, and Ryan um, had this idea when we were in Gadget of, like, you know, let's build, like, this... Like the ultimate like gadget product database, like something that's like, like kind of like a crowdsourced Wikipedia for gadgets. Right. And we kind of thought, well, these two things fit together. I mean, right. you have the the crowdsourced database, um, user created, user driven, and we're getting you know we've gotten we're getting like you know hundreds of product submissions a week um, for the database. Uh, with this like kind of like social layer on top of it, right. we're like, UK. Okay, now it's not just about creating the database. It's like you can kind of collect the gadgets on the site and right. create your profile and all this stuff. And then we have kind of like a third layer on top of that where we're actually saying, okay, now you have this stuff and you can sort of now you can sort of log in and see what your what friends your gadgets are checking out or adding to their list or they're talking about. You can get um, a- aggregated activity from across the site. You can get uh, news links and stuff like that. Like really kind of thinking of it as like. You know, like a like a Facebook type activity feed for your gadget universe, whether it's your friends or your gadgets. See, yeah. I, I, so the the relationships that you build are with the product objects, right? Yeah. So it's it, there's this third leg of the stool that hasn't really existed before. It's always right. been user to user. Right. Any any social site is always user to user. There isn't ever anything in the in that third. There's nothing you're leg. sort of pivoting off of. It's the pivot point. Yeah. Right. So so we so use, you and we I use the have gadget. a relationship because we have the same phone. Right. While exactly. You and I might have a relationship because we use the same laptop. So you you, exactly. you connect users. Uh, you know, uh, with with a gadget as an intermediary, or you connect to a gadget with a user as an intermediary. So right. th- there's these this other whole set of social interactions that begins to occur once you have a product object as a, as, as a social. And, and I'll, I'll give uh, you can pull out my screen here for a second. It, I'm a, I'm a user on it, and my account is Jason Calacanis. So people can add me. And I actually, what would that mean? Would be would I be Jason Calacanis or it it's user user, user dot gdgt dot com slash Jason Calacanis. Okay, so you can go at uh, add me. At user.gdgt.com slash Jason Calacanis, C A L A C A N I S. And, but what's really interesting when you use it, I pulled it up on the screen here for the users to see, is uh, you go uh, search for something, right? Like I know I'm getting the Zune HD. I ordered two of the Zune HDs, one for me and one for Kevin Pollock, because we are we want Microsoft to sponsor this show and his show. Uh, and the Zune HD happens to be beautiful. I mean, I saw this thing, it's gorgeous. I actually played with it. Uh, somebody I know has one, or had one like a month ago. I have one here. Like yeah, it's gorgeous. Pull it out. Should have uh, brought it in. So anyway, you start it typing in. it in, and it, it basically finds it in your product database. Yeah. And I can zoom in here, but here it is, and I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. Uh, you can add it to your list. Right. And what's interesting is that, let me zoom in over here, because I have that zoom feature if I do it right. There you go. So here we are. And what's interesting is you see here, um, 262 users have it. 3,400 want it. Yeah. And you can see all the images of it, ratings of it, and now I can add it to my list over here on the bottom left. Um, and I, since I'm getting that, we'll click Add to List, and it says, oh, have it, want it, had it, actually. Previous right. tense, which that's the stroke of genius for me. Like, you got rid of it. I want to know why you got rid of it, right? right? I mean, is, are people using that? or People are using that, and also a lot of people want to add stuff to the database that they had, gadgets they had 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, so, so part that's of That's demented. Yeah. Well, it, but th- that's also the, but cool. know, the, the neat cool. aspect of the site. Well, I have right? a PC like, Junior. Does that mean the IBM PC Junior is in there? I think the PC Junior is, yeah. PC oh, Junior my is God. See, this is yeah. just insane because I still have mine. Uh, well, here's another thing. I have the Zune on order. So maybe there needs to be one that I have it on order. <laughs> but it makes it a little more complicated. So let's see. IBM PC Junior. I, that is demented. So now GDGT becomes the place for people who had... I'm not putting people on. This was my first computer, <laughs> and uh, and interestingly, you're monetizing with uh, people think, selling it. I think I think the best part four is users that four own it. Still have it. Yeah, yeah I own it. it. I have it. It's in my mom's basement. Boom. See who else has it. I want to see who else has it. Oh, this is so genius. Okay, hold on a second. Let's see. Okay, got it for you. Oh, wait here. There are there's pictures of them. Yeah. Who has it? M D Erst, who has the click, JD click the link right below. I'll give you everybody. Oh, yeah. let's see who has. It. Okay, there we go. Click everybody. Um, and look at it, it's, it's a, they, there's actually support discussions. You know any of these guys? This guy no, has 18 gadgets, t- owns 21 gadgets. What does the average person own in the system now? Eight or nine. Yeah, eight, eight or nine? Yeah. And what did it start out with in month one? 
Was it, is this, this it's, is always been, it's always been really It's always high. been pretty solid. Well, it's yeah. a, really? it's, it scales with the user base. Yeah. Um, we we've found that people really like adding products to their list, and, and we've added some features to kind of make that an even yeah. more useful it, it, we're experience. Gonna, we're actually, we'll make it easy easier um, you know, in, with uh, some what's updates to the site. Truly, what's truly demented about this is that this two people have actually edited it now. Yeah. I'm looking at the site. They actually put in the specs, 4.77 megahertz. Uh, original MSRP is 1300 discontinued system RAM 0.13 megabytes yeah, 0.13 <laughs> megabytes it came with 128k in my first computer yeah. and so I upgraded it to 640 but this yeah. is like this is exactly the kind of thing that we wanted to be able to have the site be able to do was you know although you can't necessarily account for every gadget that ever existed and, and we know that and it's like one thing that some we people, might try but yeah <laughs> we, we will certainly do our best um, but when we built the database, we actually built it so you could still have older products that, although they may have like a you know kind of a decreased resolution of data, they're still in there, and they're the, you could you could actually take that computer, take the PC Junior computer, and compare it to like your MacBook Pro today, yeah, and do a side by side comparison. That's yeah. awesome. You know, it's like the system doesn't you know uh, discriminate. Yeah, um, I am just posting this link to Twitter. My first computer was an IBM PC Junior. What was your first computer? And I'm putting the link to it. Um, that is like a sort of a magical, fun experience. It actually proves the point that we actually have this, like you were saying earlier, Peter. Yeah, I mean, it, it, magical relationship. Why do we have this relationship? You know, I, I think that um, technology has has really um, something has really changed in the past five or six years. I, I think that gadgets have. Um, but I, but I'm having this feeling about a, a computer that came out in 1983. Yeah, but I'm saying, but it's like it, it's it's if we, it's it's like accelerating, it's intensifying uh-huh. right, this experience, and so I think that. Um, it, it, it's so technology is so integrated into our lives now that we actually look back really fondly on our first computer in the way that people uh, used to only really talk about their first car or right? dog or dog or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's like you really have this like fondness because it actually helped shape who you became. It did. I mean, the IBM PC Junior. I mean, look at a lot of the things they went on to do. Was that, that's where it started? That's where Weblog Zinc started. That's where yeah. Mahalo started. Hey, I started with an Atari four hundred. <laughs> Atari four hundred. I remember yeah. the Atari four hundred. Um, the, now, the interesting thing about an Atari four hundred was. And you have it obviously in the yeah. database. Oh yeah. How many people take a guess of how many people have it? Nine. Still I still have it. Yeah, that's crazy. Nine. I remember. It's, I have it here on the screen. You got to pull it up for a second. It's such a ride to look at these things. But um, this didn't even have a real keyboard. Well, that was the interesting thing. It had the, it had the membrane keyboard. Yeah. Which was fascinating. And cartridges. Yep. Uh, and you could actually get joysticks for it. And there's the basic computing. So if you wanted to use basic the language to put in a cartridge, you yeah. Could and it had this. a tape drive. Right. Like I, the Commodore. Like uh, what was the other one? Um, What's the one that everyone had with the tape drives that would copy programs to each other? Yeah, well, I don't remember, but I I, I remember like um, Commodore. It, it was a Commodore. But Commodore I remember like had, I got Zaxxon on the tape for the uh, yeah, as a okay, tape yeah. drive. Yeah. And I remember like being like, hey, to my friends, like, come over, come over after school, let's play Zaxxon. Six minutes. Which you can only. <laughs> it took two hours to get it off the tape. Two hours? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? So you're like, hey, let's buy Xbox 60, 360. Yeah. Come back in two hours. Come back in two hours. <laughs> Come over at 8 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Should we change the game? Sure, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. And look at the, you have all, and you, more from Atari, the Lynx 2. What a great one. Yeah, so actually, yeah. yeah 2600 you, Jaguar. Ugh, what a disaster. If you go to, click, uh, click the Atari button. Uh, okay, more from Atari, sure. Yeah, you, you can see everything. And then, yeah, so this will, this is actually like the browser oh. interface, so you can go through all Oh, can I products. become a fan of the company or not yet? Not, not yet. yet. We'll have we're that. Working. That's what I want to do. I want to become fans of a we're, company. We're, we're doing that. Um, so yeah, if you go, go down a little bit. All so 19 Atari products <gasps> in the database. This is, you can actually start to... Flashback, like, wow. And you can go through and just add every, you know, add every single one. Exactly. That is just super pong. I had the 2600. So yeah, well, 20, we, everyone had a 2600. So if you go up to the top... I had a Sears 2600. If you resort the list. Uh, there it is, 2600. Oh, okay, there you go. I'm gonna have to add that. 286 people. Yeah, it's very popular. Yeah. Popularity 9.8. Um, I had this list. I'm gonna put that on hack because I don't have it anymore. I don't know where my 2600 went. So one of the things I found was really interesting is uh, when you uh, start using this, I had problems with my MacBook Air, uh, and I'm like, why can't I watch Hulu without it skipping? I got all these problems, and I posted that there, and there's like seven other people who are like. Oh, I talked to the Genius Bar. I talked to this person. It's very well documented. When you connect and you pivot on a gadget or something like that, you're guaranteed to get a really qualified answer or really qualified advice. You know, it's like yeah, because if you follow, like for instance, if you follow the Mac, if MacBook Air is one of the, the gadgets that you have on your on your have list, 
when you're logged in and you hit the front page and someone asks a question about the MacBook Air, you see that. Or if you have the RSS feed for the front page feed for the, the, your gadget stream, you pull that RSS feed. So that means that like you're not just following activity from your friends, you're following activity from the gadgets that you're interested in. Right. And so if you have one, who better to answer a question about the MacBook Air than people who have them? Yeah. Right. So and rather than having research. To, and rather than having to wait for those people to like go and like trawl the the discussions, that actually gets pushed out to them. Yeah. It comes. It comes, it comes to, to them. them. Ah, so when you're, that's what. So the newsfeed on the homepage is built off of your gadget collection. Exactly, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the people it's and gadgets so, that you follow. Yeah, so it's uh, like if Facebook is the the live stream of all of your friends and their life and their yeah. life, then what this is is your friends, and then your gadgets are also treated as your friends. So activities surrounding your gadgets are coming through as well. Yeah. So it's 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 a mix. It's it's friends and products, and so you come in contact with uh, users who you may not necessarily know because you share that product in common somehow. Right. So like when you when you posted that yeah. question. And here's an interesting thing too. I just went to the Zoom HD which I have coming. You guys I guess summarize the rev or pull in the reviews from mm -hmm. trusted people. So yeah. when I come to this page it's got all the reviews even from like you know, like sort of weird places like Tom's Guide, which I read, and, and Gadget, which not a weird place, but you got so many different reviews. Yeah, of but it. users but can yeah, aggregate that together. Users, yeah. users can add that. Um, oh, the but users also, add users use those links. We, 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 we are very concerned with spam and noise, so all the sites that are able to add those review links are ones that we've personally approved. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it's this place where you, you know you're going to get these kinds of trusted links. Like in um, Gadget is clear, you can add in any you can add any Gadget review yeah. link. Right. Uh, so you can't add, you know, my mygadgetblog.blogspot.com. I mean, that may be a great site, but you know, until you've kind of right. proven yourself, yeah, you, gotta you don't get, get you don't get pulled yeah. into so the validate thing, you know. each one for, yeah. you know. Which is nice because from user experience like you don't have to deal with any spam links. Mm. But yeah, so I mean, it kind of bring this all back, I mean, the goal was really, if we can, and, and this this speaks to your MacBook Air um, support issue, if, if you can build a community and a database that is structured enough that you can kind of let everything mediate itself. Yeah, uh, it's and, about and let, let that value. Yeah, and let everything kind of, uh, let, let the community make those connections and just create enough structure that people can make these connections to each other. Yeah. Um, then you know you, you see all this great stuff happen. It's pretty amazing. You guys have tapped into something. I guess Flickster is a similar. A bit, yeah. A Goodreads. I guess there's a couple of people who have sort of come upon this idea that if you take, you know, certain things that people are passionate about and, and put some social features on. I don't know if anybody's done it as eloquently as you guys have yet. Well, we have a long way to go too. I mean, there's yeah. so many things that I mean that we need to do <laughs> before we feel like we're going to be happy with this. But we think that we. Uh, let's put it this way. That same kind of feeling that we had um, a few months into Engadget, we're like, this seems to be something. We like, we kind of hit something. Yeah, there's, here. there's, there's like there's I have that here. same feeling about GDGT that like, yeah. it's like something feels like like it's working. It, I mean, it, famous last words, right? But well, I mean, but I mean, uh, no, <laughs> yeah, I, I, true. I, I mean, I don't want to jinx it or anything, but no, I, I mean, I, I feel I, like it feels like things are coming together. Not that we don't have a ton of work to do, and there's so many things we need to improve, but that like. It kind of feels like we're on the path. We know what the path is, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's that level of freshness where you see people kind of you know their eyes light up and they're like oh, like you know, back like in gadget twenty four seven gadget news. I can find news about any gadget I'm interested. Gadget You know your eyes light Was up. That, wasn't that a metaphor I used at some point saying yeah. CNN for gadgets? Yeah. yeah. I mean it's bad because of what CNN is today, but it, what CNN aspired to do is. You know, it's very clear. So this yeah, time so we're like when people, people got it for gadgets. CNET for gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Facebook for gadgets would be a better. No, I'm dissing CNET. Right? I know, I know. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, Imagine pretty if CNET were about gadgets, about technology. <laughs> it was actually pretty funny how a couple of guys, you know, with no resources, really could just crush CNET and the New York Times at something like CES. I mean, when we went there, yeah. we. What do we have? Ten people the first year? No, was it we six had people the first? Four or five people six, the first year. Six, six people. like a, like part time, but yeah. yeah there's, All right, so we still have five people the first year. The next year, it was like ten people. It was like, I know because I got these hotel room bills. Yeah. Ten people the next year, and by the third year, was it 20, 25? 25, I think. Twenty-five people. It grew by about seven people every year. Yeah. So yeah, because I remember seeing Saul Hansel from the New York Times there, and I said, oh, I, don't know. I said, yeah, we're here with Ga and Gadget, and he was like, oh, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and away. I was like, how many? Um, how many people do you have here? It's like, well, it's me and Markov and this person. I was like, oh, you have three people? We have five. We have more people here than the New York Times. Yeah. 
And that was when I, the epiphany went off for me, and I was like, wait a second. Well, we were the first people to cover the show in real time. Like, right. We were the first people that were like, oh, you know what? Let's live blog every press conference. Every press conference. Let's Why not? live blog. And um, in truth, you created the live blog format. Had anybody done a live blog before that? Uh, I think some of the Mac sites had been doing like really basic kind uh, of like... Yeah, there's, they're, 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 they're good not, stuff. I mean, I didn't invent like it. the IRC but, and... Um, but yeah, I mean, I like I like to think, I think that, that the like, stuff that we did over the years like kind of really helped gel that format. You right, know, it's yeah. something like people now expect like what a live blog a live blog should look like A, B, and C. Yeah. Right. And and gadget had a lot to do with that. Right. And, and I think like I mean we still have live blogging uh, events, which is I mean it's one I of think the it's a smart move. Still... So you don't you don't compete with Engadget on a day to day grind, but you do do the Steve Jobs keynote because you have a unique slant on it. Yeah, I mean, I don't you know, think there's anybody better qualified to do that than us. <laughs> right, considering how many have how many Steve notes have you got? And you guys were the first to call it a Steve note. But how many Steve notes I, have I, you each made? I can't even count. Jobs notes. Uh, so either. many. A jobs I, mean, note? I, I mean, and I literally done, can't even count. And we, we both we've done every, Bill every Gates. single one for like last five we've years. Done, basically, uh, I mean, we've done a lot. That was another great moment. Was when you interviewed Bill Gates. Yeah, and now we've both actually interviewed Bill Gates. I think twice. And Bomber. Um, I haven't interviewed Bomber, but I've, 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 interviewed, interviewed, I've interviewed Gates Bomber. like yeah. two, three times. Bomber. Which was a, which was another mind blowing thing. I was like, wow, uh, Steve, uh, um, Bill Gates is taking time out for him. Well, I remember really? when he was interviewed. He did an interview, and somebody said, "Well, what you know, what websites do you read every day?" And he's like, "Well, the first thing I hit every morning is in Gadget." Yeah. That, well, Interestingly, that's what Steve Jobs said to me. I, Steve Jobs saw my badge at the D conference, and it said Weblogs Inc. slashing Gadget because that was the most known property. So I put both on there. Yeah. And Steve Jobs says, "Oh, you were in Gadget?" I said, "Yeah." And he says, "Oh, uh, I read that every day." And I said, "Oh, you know." And I said, "Can I ask why do you read it?" And he said, "Competitive intelligence." Yeah. And I said, "Don't you have people for that?" And this PR guy, who's the famous PR guy, was with him. Who, Steve Dowling. I can't remember. But anyway, the famous PR guy goes, oh, we have people for that. They're just not as good as yours. We did get a lot of that. People saying uh, that one of the reasons they're writing gadgets because they want to know what their competitors are up to because yeah. we were very, very good at, at sourcing material. I mean, this was the thing that, that nobody was really doing with tech journalism was saying, I'm going to go and, and, hustle. and hustle and dig stuff up and, and try to... It's so many uh, scoops. Get the scoops. But also, I think there was... I, I think that people didn't realize that there was a market for scoops about gadgets, about being able to yeah, know. Like no, who cares? Like no one was publishing. Like once I read Herring, if I said, "Hey, Apple's doing an iPhone," a phone, and I have this, yeah. like they'd be like, "So what? We'll wait for it to be announced." Yeah, who cares? <laughs> yeah, we'll go to the press conference. No, don't yeah. worry. We we know the PR person there. Yeah, and, and then you guys it, were getting us sued. Well, it's because we're outsiders. <laughs> right, we right, didn't right, exactly. have connections. But it's it's that it's that same kind of thinking that kind of led us to where we are now because yeah, right. that world has been covered, right? Right. We we invented the machines that now completely. Cover and come to destroy us. <laughs> well, exactly. They become sentient. But so yeah. But so now, now that that world is just completely done, and it's, it's, that's it's I mean that was it's 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 perfected in a way. Yeah, exactly. And now we you know with these with like, engaging his motor, I mean the perfect engines for doing this. And, yeah. and so we knew we didn't want to do that again. So right. it was like, what what is all the other stuff? You know, what is what is all the crowd stuff? What is all Absolutely. the you know the wisdom of of the audience, which in reality really helped inform Engadget. I mean, Engadget was made so much better. By the audience, Absolutely. and so we were never really able to tap into that before, and that was kind of the goal here: was like, how can we tap into that audience? You yeah. know, there's there's a lot of fanatical gadget users out there who create a lot of value and don't really have a system or a mechanism for doing that in a useful way. I mean, and so that's kind of what GDGT is: it's it's a mechanism to create value for the gadget world by people who are you know extremely in it they're very passionate about it yeah one of my favorite things is, is people are now posting on the site and saying hey i just got x y you know or z gadget i'll take what what questions do you have and there isn't really another place good place to do that i mean there are definitely other discussion boards and, and bulletin board type sites out there but i think there isn't really one like uh, overreaching, overarching site like we have that that people actually can ask a question or, or, or ask a question or even uh, agree to take questions and feel like they're going to get questions or, or they're going to get that interaction. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I think, like I said, that's why I think we have something like we're onto something like really, like really special here. We just need to like make it better. We need to make it easier for people to participate, and we need to make it. It's getting uh, easier. I mean, you guys have. It's done. getting easier. We're working. I mean, I think one of the things that. Um, I, I kind of learned from Engadget was like you just have to do, and then yeah. uh, and then and then and you work do from the there. best you can. You do the best you can, and then you and then you you self. It's the, it's a very self correcting process, and right. I don't mean just like you're sloppy, you make mistakes, but I mean like, you know, we could spend um, 
uh, you know, years planning and planning and planning and trying to like, you know, guess everything that needs to be done. But it was really only after we launched the site that we kind of were like, well, actually, this is the part that we might need to start to emphasize. It was only after. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that's the, the, why you got to release the first. The first five features that we planned for the site turns out we didn't we didn't need we're them like, at all. We, we like, there were five things that we like yeah, exactly five yeah. things that we hadn't even thought. Yeah, about. yeah, we had we had a roadmap of things. We were like, okay, this is exactly what we're going to do after launch, and then we threw that out. We're like, yeah, okay, we up, tore it up, and we're like, this is what we actually start over. All right, so some uh, questions and comments from the audience. Uh, Monty Burke, you can pull up my screen, um, says, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. GGGT is an awesome site. Just signed up for it tonight. So, oh, great, thanks. That's very nice of him to say. Um, here's one from HowsThe.com on Twitter. Uh, and he says, will GDGT have a blog spin on it? Any plans on launching a blog? Blogs, like yeah. having a blog? Yeah, having a blog. I mean, we do. I mean, we do have a blog in the sense that, like, we do occasionally write stuff on the site, or if um, we, you know. I think he's talking about a news blog. Are you gonna ever compete with Engadget? I don't know if we want to. I don't think we want yeah. to. I think that. Um, I think it's, it, it's hard to see kind of making that model work with what we're doing now. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like I'd, I'd rather things. have all that. I'd rather have that stuff kind of user mediated and, and crowdsourced, so to speak, um, yeah. than having to build a top-down editorial platform on grafted onto what we're doing. So Matt, Plus it's like, look, we, we know a gadget better than anybody. We know right. the ins and outs of a gadget. Everybody who works at a gadget, Peter and I hired and trained Correct. personally. Yeah. Those guys are great. You're doing and a great job. I, yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly yeah. like itching to go up against those guys. I mean, yeah, they no. do a great job. Yeah, yeah no need to duplicate. It's a, I think it's about focusing on what, what you can do really well. So Mad uh, Kipiaka, whatever that is, uh, says, uh, were you guys ever worried about not getting the posts right in the fast pace where you just counted on editing them afterwards? How did you deal with the pace? Uh, uh, well, the pace was pretty intense. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I was able to sort of work up to it, I guess, because when I started Gizmodo, it was 6 to 10 posts a day. At one point in a gadget, I was doing 25 to 35 posts a day. Did it make you more error prone? How did you deal with that? Uh, I mean, I definitely, you definitely made mistakes, uh, right. and I definitely worried about them a lot. <laughs> uh, and, especially and with comments under it. Especially with comments. Um, You'll find out but, real quick. Yeah, but yeah. that's, I mean, that goes back to what I was saying before. The audience actually helps you craft better editorial. Sure. As soon yeah. as they start chiming in, you know you screwed up, you correct it immediately, you're less likely to make that mistake again in the future. Yeah, but you try not yeah, to make mistakes. You try to, I mean, I tried really hard. We tried really hard not to make mistakes in the first yeah, place. People yeah, people review yeah, posts absolutely. before they went out. And, you know, the, the other advantage about writing about gadgets is, you know, a good 75% is, like, new gadget launch. And then it's just, you know, what are the numbers? What are the specs? You know, yeah. not a lot to screw up there. And yeah. what, what there is to screw up there is not that big of a deal. But, you know, it's like, okay, it's, it's typo, a right. 3.5 instead of a 3.2 inch screen. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the world's not ending. Sometimes I'd, I'd make a mistake just because I was For so some sleep people, deprived or something. But. The world is ending if you get those specs wrong, I would suppose. There's yeah. some people who are on tilt. It happens uh, sometimes. Anthony Rosario asks Will GDGT ever offer an option to nuke the ads? To nuke the ads, like yeah, a yeah. Like, can I pay and can I pay fifty bucks and be a member? You know, and turn I've, the ads off because I I've think that's a pretty heard, cool option. I've, but I've never heard of that being like really successful, like like Neither an option I. that is just like you know ten percent of the users take advantage. I think Slashdot offered that. Isn't it an ad know. blocker? I mean. If you're an ad blocker user, then you're you're kind of like <laughs> an unpaid customer, <laughs> right? You know? I mean, but so. there, there are a percentage. I mean, if you you could turn off JavaScript, and you're not going to see any ads. Turn off images, you're not going to see ads. You can selectively turn them back on. I mean, people. Okay, do this I, I will I will say this uh, on on the record. Um, I wish that we didn't have to have ads, and sure. I would like you know I would love if the web could be a place where there were fewer ads and there were alternate business models. And who knows? I mean, maybe we'll have a you know a you know. Drop a tip in the in the jar, and we can turn off ads for you. I don't It'll know what that's going to work. Like. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 I, that's not a business model, I don't think. But well, I'll um, ask people in the chat room uh, how many people would ever consider a paid subscription. Would you to um, would you consider a paid subscription to turn off the ads on your favorite website? Just yes, you would pay to turn off ads, or no, you would. See, wouldn't. the thing I don't, I don't that, think that, I'm trying to. Yeah, I don't that care. Is that there's like no larger infrastructure, so it's like, yeah. what if I wanted to pay the consortium of ad-free publishers fifty dollars a year, and then a whole big yeah. block of sites on the internet, my ads go off. You know, yeah, like I'm not to, seeing ads anymore. Yeah, like a site, a pass, like an easy pass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's like if you're doing it a site at a time, it becomes like really tedious. You know, five I, bucks here, ten bucks there. I think the problem is that ads are just not. I mean, as annoying as ads are, they're really not that annoying when it comes down to it. Like, very rarely, unless you have a site with obnoxious pop-ups and things like that, which... Yeah, and that's the other thing. Peter and I, over the years, have spent a lot of time <laughs> really, really trying to pay close attention to the quality of ads. And you can never be 100% 
sure about that. But it's like, look, advertiser comes if to us. If they're relevant. Here's, here, okay, here's a, a real world example. Advertiser came to us a couple days ago, like, we'd love you know, to pay you a, a, a ton of money to run this pop under. You know, it's like the window pops under your car oh, window. Yeah, and we're like, no. hell no. No. You know, Tell look, yourself. we're a startup and we're not making a lot of money, right? We're Tell like, we're, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. We're just trying to do our thing, but no. That's, the, pro that's no. the proper response. Kill yourself. <laughs> Please. I mean, that would be my, that's usually my response yeah, when people we, would ask us those things. That. Like, I mean, that was the one thing we did get right, I, I feel like I'm always proud of, is with the whole Weblog Sync experience, we, we had a very good corporate culture of protecting the editorial, nurturing the editorial, yeah. nurturing the writers. Uh, when you look back on the experience um, and you look at what you guys are doing now having to run the ship and what do you think um, you know now that you didn't know then? Like, what, what's, the, what's the big lesson now that you're running your own business that you look at and go, oh, wow, now I see where Jason was coming from or Brian was coming from at that time. Well, you, you know what I will say is the way that you know, it, the, the culture at Weblogs is like taking care of the editors and, and making sure that they had what they need to kind of, you know, get the job done and feel good about their product. Like, that's, I think, how we feel about our users. Right. Because our users are, in a way, our editors. editors yeah. yeah. And so it's like, we need to take care of our users, and we need to respond to their needs, and we need to give them what they want uh, in order to make our product better. Yeah. You know, if, if, if there were no contributing users to GDGT, it would There's basically no be worthless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not like Engadget, which could publish into the ether for all eternity. Absolutely. Although it might comments not work as none. a business. There's yeah, still, exactly. Although it might not work as a business, you could do it. Yeah. Actually. Without users, GDGT is does not exist. So you know, our, our our primary responsibility, I think, is to them. And so I think that that's actually a lesson that we learned uh, in terms of taking care of your people. Yeah. What about you? I think yeah. one of the things that I I, I learned from from you is. Um, uh, well, from the experience. From, from, from the from experience, but, yeah. but also specifically from you is like, um, in the way that you treated me actually was, um, find people that are smart, pe find people that, that you trust, and let them do their thing, right? And um, and, and don't micromanage them. And yeah. I think that like we've kind of really brought that over to to GDGT. But it's like we've, I mean, our team is amazing. I mean, it's it's honestly like I, I I like honestly I feel like I have to work harder to like earn those guys' respect yeah. rather than the other way around. Like I feel like I got to reach, I got to. Their mornings are awake up, and I'm like, man, I gotta like rise up to the level of my team, right? Because um, that's how I mean the dedication and like I mean the amount of that's hours. That's always a good. That's like that. always a good situation. Um, and so, uh, uh, so that and, and and I think that what we do is we find really good people and we let them do their thing. And like if someone isn't able to to function in that kind of environment, like they're it, in the wrong environment. They're in the yeah. wrong environment. It's yeah. not a right or a wrong. It's just about what's yeah. right for you. There's and, a better place for those. There, people. And there's some people who need a lot of structure in, in, in the way that they work. And I, I absolutely I, I, don't, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Because there were points in not my life. Not for a startup. I've had jobs where yeah. I needed a lot of structure. Right. Um, and, and I, you know. It's just it, not a startup. A startup is the wrong exactly. place for something like that. Um, but one of the other things that I think that, that I learned from you, um, or from, you know, being a Weblog Sync or whatever, was that um, there's sort of a, 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 it's important to offer like a good kind of quality of life. To, right. to people that, that work with you and that like I, one of the things that you always did was like a lot of like team dinners a lot of like I don't team building is kind of a corny way to describe it because yeah. it's not really but we had fun just, but just about having fun and realizing that like um, that we're all in, you know we're all sort of in this together and that like it, it, it you have to have a very kind of horizontal organization and you have to have um, uh, people that you know feel like they can um, you know that they are kind of like in the trenches together so to speak yeah and and so we've gone, you know, we do like team dinners all the time. Like we really like we play Call of Duty together. Like yeah. we really like have tried to um, build like a. I mean, I want people like when they're in the chat room um, because we collaborate virtually for the most yeah, part. Yeah, sure. To feel like that that's a fun place to actually be. Yeah, there's nowhere uh, else they would rather. Yeah, be. and like it's not like somebody, not like Ryan and I like complaining because someone's like put a funny uh, like link to a YouTube video in the chat room yeah. or something like that, which is like oh people are goofing off, but. I kind of want people to goof off a little bit. Like we yeah. work hard, but we also want people to like feel like they're having a good time when they're when they're they're working with us. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it's very typical for startups to say like, oh yeah, you know, we we look we try to build culture and you know we we try to um, you know cultivate the right kind of people. But I mean, it's totally true. If if you've got somebody who's really really well qualified for the position and just does not have a personality, it's going to mesh. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's not if, work. if you it's don't go happen. about your life and your work with joy. That joie de vivre, that sort of energy, it's going to be, you're, you're going to crush the startup. You've got to have people who are really into it, enthusiastic. And I have a rule that I have to somehow formulate, but basically, my belief is the more times you break bread with a person you know, that you work with, yeah. the, the better you are going to both perform together. 
It's just something about sharing a meal and the casualness of it and just enjoying each other's company. I think it's probably also the way I grew up, there's probably a lesson I got from my dad was we always had dinner together. Yeah. And he always had people over for dinner. He always cooked for people. And it just always seemed like those people were closer. And the families who didn't have their dads or their moms around for dinner or they just ordered pizza or whatever and they're on their own, uh, they didn't have the same relationship. Yeah. And I, look, I know, I know it seems a little sentimental, but... Um no, I mean, I you know, I, I look for a work relationship where I feel like these are people who I can trust implicitly, right. uh, people who I feel like they are a part of my extended yeah. family. Yeah. Um, and usually, I mean, not always, but usually if I don't feel that way about somebody, it, it's not a coincidence that they don't wind up lasting very long. You know, right. it's just like the fit isn't quite there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, you got you got to work well and close and, uh, and, and happily with, uh, with, with your people. And if there's any doubt, there is no doubt. <laughs> if you ever have a doubt about somebody, there's no doubt about what you should do. Well, yeah. I, I think it's funny because ninety nine times out of hundred. I mean, we've definitely More had, or less. I've had people that we've thought about hiring and, and you have sort of like a slightly like there's some sort of weird like, dust up right at the yeah. beginning. Oh. And you're kinda of, not like not like a like a, a fighter, sign. But you're kinda of like that's weird. You kind of like, oh, you kind of get frustrated that like, oh, that person would be so great to hire, and then you're like, well, but the fact that it was a little bit of static there, like, yeah. the fact that like they were just raised a little bit of a, a hurdle. Right. To, Some, I think I think they should do an entire show. Turns out being no, a blessing. Something in like their HR documents, or they, yeah. they acted really upset because there was something with their computer, or they, you know, they they get like agitated at something or passive aggressive. You're just like, what? That's should, weird. We should just do an entire show about uh, hiring practices because I think, yeah. I think that is like actually the lifeblood of any startup is you are your people. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. You're, you are your people, and picking those people is both the most challenging, but also possibly the most re- rewarding aspect. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I, well, that's one of the things. Like I was so picky with Engadget. I remember you I remember. hassling me like hire more, and I'm like, I well, I mean, hire. listen, I, w- I think it was good to a point, except if. It was the point at which you broke down. So I, my no, I know. view was always the, 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 the Peter. There's not another Peter Rojas out there. So what we have to do is try and make one. Yeah. And I think that we did settle into sort of, sort of good compromise about that. Is is this person going to become eighty or ninety percent of what you're capable of? And if they're at forty or fifty and willing to learn, well, let's make them. Because well, and we, I think that I mean Ryan turned out to be that. Per- I mean, absolutely, he's one hundred and ten percent. Yeah, of me, like, oh, but, oh. but you know what I mean. <laughs> but, but I but I think one of the things is that, like I really wanted it to be like Peter and Ryan, not. Peter and his team, like, right? You know what I mean. Like I wanted to be. You no, know, you, like, you did a good job of elevating him as a peer, which was always good. Which is what I always tried to do with you in terms of as an owner of the business. Right. I always refer to you as a partner, just because people I think were very dismissive. I think Nick Denton was always dismissive of you, and other people were dismissive of you. And I knew that was an issue for you, and couldn't have made you feel good. So I always went out of my way to introduce you at whatever event, not as the editor of Engadget. I would always introduce him as my partner. Yeah, and I'd I always say really it was my partner that. Brian and my partner. Peter. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the things that frustrated about me about Gizmodo is that there was never, um, like, Nick never trusted me. Yeah, it's a it's a bummer. But I mean, you know what? He never wanted me to, to be successful. Yeah, if he's not rude, if you're not, <laughs> I know. I'm glad the box. <laughs> you gotta play that never like, love me. music. <laughs> no, but uh, it is a. Um, <laughs> I, I had the Shit. same experience. All right. I was doing. Let it all out, guys. <laughs> I was doing this week in tech at Leo. <laughs> Okay. This has been, this has been it's really cathartic. Right, so this has been a very sobbing. cathartic episode. It was supposed to be a short little bonus episode. It turned out to be an hour and 20 minutes. I'm sorry to the person who has the studio after me. I think there's somebody who needs the studio. Um, thank you to the sponsors at Ustream, at DNA Mail, at WebSpy, at Audible underscore COM. Somebody, for the love of God, get Audible from Twitter. Somebody at Twitter, whoever, whoever owns Audible, can you just give it to Audible and they'll give you a free subscription or something? Please. For the love of God, I have to say audible underscore C-O-M. It's making me crazy. Mm. Yeah. That's frustrating. Take care of it. It's killing. Jason Nation, we're... Uh, Somebody on. please get on the horn and make call the happen. Twitter gods and make it happen. Uh, thank you, Alex, for pulling this together really quick. Thanks to the audience. It was like 300 people in there uh, watching live, and people were... I, there's many more questions you guys can look at and many more people talking about it. Everybody do me one favor. One favor, one favor only. Right now, whether you're listening to this... Uh, Right now, or you're listening to it on tape, or a year from now, go to GDGT, create an account, and then Twitter your profile name and say, hey, add me as a friend. And I'll see that, and I'll add you as a friend. So everybody add yourself. Uh, I think it's user.gdgt.com slash your username. So if you're Tom, it's user.gdgt.com slash, and it's Peter? Yeah. 
That's and that's slash Ryan. I had to start my own site. So I can, can we get whoever's got Jason? Can you get that back for me and then I can drop the Calacanis? I can be slash Jason. <laughs> Jason. Somebody's well, got we'll, the Jason. We'll look into it. Yeah. But Somebody, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how we're doing for time. But I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't mind hopping on chat after the the show's over and just answering a few questions. Yeah, if we have time. There might be some people still. Out, so we'll keep the uh, stream going. Thanks, guys, for coming on. This is great to, yeah, to have you guys. Continued success, and we'll see you all in the next episode of This Week in Startups on Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday, two days from now, you're getting three shows. Three shows on fire in, a, in like a week. Three shows in a week, not quite daily, but uh, Wednesday we're going to be taping live from the Digital Family Reunion here. They asked us to come out. Incredible guests: Mike Jones, the COO of uh, MySpace, ah. also a rapper, and what from <laughs> Sublime. No, 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 he was uh, at User Voice. He sold it. I think User Voice. Um, User Plane sold that to AOL. Now he's at MySpace. We're going to talk all about no, MySpace. Was, yeah. Mike MySpace is doing a lot of great things. I just I, I logged in for the first time on MySpace today for like in six months. They actually cleaned it up. Yeah. They cleaned it up. Yeah. You uh, hook it up to your Twitter today. They, they, I mean, they're yeah, actually releasing news, features. Yeah. These are the first three features uh, on MySpace since the uh, feature of adding an MP3 file, which happened in 2004. That was ages ago. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's, 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 we probably added some features between them, but I never knew about them. <laughs> uh, we'll see you all next time on Wednesday for This Week in Startups. With this